afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael. As always, on the fourth Wednesday of the month, it's time for our Bird Notes program. And we're joined, again, as always, by Mark Labar, conservation biologist for Audubon, Vermont. And Mark's focus today is Audubon's 119th Christmas bird count. Thanks for coming in. It's always great to be here, Will. So this is something that's fun every year. Every year is different. Um, and now we know that another Christmas bird count has come and gone. So we get to walk through some results today. Yeah, so 119 years of community scientists going out and looking for birds around Christmas time. It was started way back when people used to go out and shoot the early 1900s birds instead of just count them. And the count started in the very early 1900s. In fact, the first reported count data from Vermont was in 1902 with a total of three species and four individuals. And the four first count circle, so the way that the count works is there's a count circle that has about a 15 mile diameter. There's 22 of those in the state. Yeah. So the first count circle came out in 1903 in Brattleboro. So this has been a long, um, long ongoing community science project. Scientists use this data uh, and it's great fun for birders um, all over the place. So it brings people in and it provides us information at the same time. We've come a long ways from four counters and three species. Yes, back. yeah, and, and <laughs> even in how the data is recorded because now a lot of the data is put up on eBird, which is an electronic uh, database. And so again, that just provides information um, with all the changes that are going on. Scientists can look at that and come up with some ideas, eruptive species that might show up and things of that nature. But today what I wanted to focus on was the Burlington count, primarily because um, the count this year had a lot of highs for species that you know, weren't necessarily here 20 some odd years ago, uh, whose numbers are really starting to pick up. So I wondered actually if that was gonna be part of the theme and when, presuming with some changing climate and other issues that this was going to begin to happen. Yeah. So, so what do you have to get us started? So, you know, one of the birds that, um, you know, and I've noticed this at the Audubon is back when I started 20 some odd years ago, we never had tufted titmice. Okay, uh, the tufted titmouse, a uh, great little bird, um, you know, that big eye. And maybe 10 years ago, they started showing up at our feeders in Huntington. Uh, they originally started in the Champlain Valley, in the Connecticut River Valley. And you mentioned climate change. It's kind of tough sometimes to say because a lot of people are bird feeding. And so there's a food source for them. So uh, they may just be taking advantage of that. Uh, another bird that, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, people would report or ask about is the Carolina wren. And the Carolina wren, um, a small little wren that people, again, are now seeing more and more. You know, there were 229 tufted titmice uh, counted on the Burlington count, and that was a high. There were 26 Carolina wrens. Um, they're a very secretive bird. Uh, so again, uh, another bird that's, um, you know, presumably increasing and people are seeing them in the summer times as well. And I was one of the people that actually having access to you, I called you to say, what's this little thing? Again, going back to the very small, tiny tufted titmouse, Mouse, right. which uh, again, I, I shared with you, I thought it was maybe a couple of other things yeah. and they're, they're very tiny. Yeah, and they've got that crest, which makes them look like there, you know, there's a couple other birds, cardinals and wax wings that are out there that have that crest. But you also had a couple of birds come to your feeder. I did, and I wanna thank Roger Lewis, our director for getting that picture back up. But yeah, the story goes very quickly that um, I tried to take a picture for you through my cell phone. It wasn't working through the window, so I got out uh, a little camera at home with an autofocus, yeah. and the first thing I was able to do was run a little video. Yeah. So there's the little 10 second clip before my battery died, and so I said to you, hey, Mark, I've never seen this bird before. Yeah, so this is another bird that had an all-time high count on the Burlington count. So I'm not the only one. No, so this is the red-bellied woodpecker. Okay, that's what you told me. Now, gets more, even more interesting. Yeah, so, you know, red-bellied woodpeckers, you can tell the males from the females. Uh, the males, uh, this one here has a pretty much a complete cap. And so you can see that red cap. It's not called a red-capped. Uh, woodpecker. We'll come um, to that in a sec. The female, on the other hand, has a, um, 
you know, you can see that cap isn't all the way complete on this bird here. So, you know, you have two, a male and a female well, are, that are there. That's what I noticed when I, once I went and downloaded the pictures, I said, well, I have at least two different birds, yeah. but then you were the one that said what you have is a male and a female. Right, right. And, it, you know, it could be a pair, it could be just... A male and a female come into your feeders. They'll often feed on suet. You know, they're yeah. a woodpecker. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, where's the red belly? That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. It, it does seem to me, and I tease you about this, that it's not the only species red-bellied. Wait a minute, that's a red-headed, but red-headed is a completely different woodpecker. It is, it is. So the red-bellied woodpecker will have a reddish blush to their bellies. And sometimes it's very visible and it's easy to see. Other times, um, you know, people don't necessarily pick up on it. So it can be a confusing bird. And you're right, the red-headed woodpecker is a completely uh, different species. Well, I just have to say before we leave that, that was a really unique experience for me. Fabulous to see, but now you're telling me that it really wasn't that unique, that this is a species that you're seeing more and more of. Well, you know, people are, again, it's one of those things that we used to get calls in the office, you know, oh, I got my, you know, red-bellied woodpeckers at the feeder. And as this count shows, uh, these birds are becoming more and more uh, prevalent throughout. Um, and again, the Burlington count focuses on the Champlain Valley. Uh, and people are just seeing them more and more, so they're not as uncommon as they used to be. Uh, some other species that stick around during the winter? So, you know, another one that had a high count, um, 129 downy woodpeckers were seen, so that's a high count for the Burlington area count. Um, this tiny little woodpecker is one that most people that bird feed are familiar with. Uh, and um, so for whatever reason, lots of people putting more feeders out. Um, the, you know, the Burlington area count picked up a, a high number for them. Uh, another woodpecker that actually came in pretty high too with 31 birds is the pileated woodpecker. Now this is the opposite end of the downy woodpecker. This is our biggest woodpecker. And again, they're around in the, in the winter, people will see them. Um, and they just came in with more of them being seen this year than in any other year that the count's been held in the Burlington Circle. That's one I want to see. Yeah. I, I haven't. And if maybe now they're becoming more prevalent, maybe I will, uh, because that red head is, stands I, right I, I guess I just imagine, especially in the winter, it's going yeah. to really stand out. And there's some question, you know, with the emerald ash borer that's coming in and with the potential decline in ash trees, that woodpecker populations may actually increase because there's just uh, greater food sources out there from all of the dead trees that are suspected to be around as, as the ash tree goes into decline. So... Very um, interesting. Yeah, so, you know, Pileated is probably around. You just got to keep your eyes op open for them. And if you're lucky, you know, I see them oftentimes flying back and forth across the road or something like that, and they do that woodpecker flight. Yep. Yeah. Now, you had one more of the winter time. time. Yeah, and this is another, and I clumped this in with the woodpeckers. Uh, so there was a high count for the white-breasted nuthatch. Uh, they found 230 of these. Now, this is a bird that comes to feeders, feeds on suet, feeds on seed, uh, but will also feed, um, and they call it the upside-down bird because it tends to feed just in this position and it will feed in the nooks and crannies in tree barks looking for various different insects. Um, so again, more feeders out there. Were the feeders filled with good seed? All those different questions uh, can, you know, more people feeding suet. Um, but in any case, that was a good bird for the count and, and, the, and the highest in the count circle. And that was the white-breasted nuthatch. Nuthatch, yes. Um, you, you mentioned something I'm just going to pick up on a little bit. One of the things I did this year, and I mentioned to you, is I, I have changed seed. Right. And I, I have a feeling that's why I'm seeing different species, because I've moved to a black oil sunflower seed. Right. So the black oil sunflower seed is kind of the universal seed that many birds will come into. Um, you can find seed out there that has millet and safflower oil, and sometimes that's um, sometimes cracked corn, and that'll work for specific species like cardinals. As you mentioned, your cardinals like to, you know, they'll often feed on the ground, yep. but that black oil sunflower seed is really, that's, that's pretty much all we feed at the, at the center.
No matter what I do, it still attracts the squirrels. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, that's an ongoing. <laughs> that's an ongoing thing. You can't beat that. So how about some of our bigger birds that might have been a, uh, spotted in the in the bird count? So common raven. Um, now ravens, uh, you know, we find them here in the Champlain Valley, uh, but they're oftentimes more associated with some of the hillier. Uh, areas of Vermont. That wedge-shaped tail really um, highlights this bird. So there was a high count of 37 birds for that. Um, you know, this count has a ton of crows, uh, so that's not an unusual sighting, but to see so many ravens. And then another bigger bird uh, is the Cooper's hawk. And the Cooper's hawk, they had 11 of those. These are a little bit tougher to find because uh, Cooper's hawks often can be secretive. Uh, we'll get calls on the phone. You know, people say, nobody's showing up my bird feeder today. And it could be either a Cooper's hawk, sharp shinned hawk, and they'll often sit off in the, you know, in the distance or tucked into a tree because they, but they'll come into feeders to feed on birds. So um, that was a high count for them as well. And then the last one, which is really great to see is folks found six peregrine falcons. Uh, now, peregrine falcons, as we've talked about before, Audubon works with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department to survey for them. Uh, they had their one of their best breeding years this year, uh, that, that really pointy wing shape. Um, so it's great to see them sticking around in Vermont, uh, a real recovery success story for that species. So Mark, when you talk about the, f the folks who counted these, and some of these species are things that we can count at our feeders, we're obviously not counting peregrine falcons at a feeder. No. So people are, so was it okay during the count to do things at a feeder, or are these all away, higher elevations, low elevations, lakeshore, riverbeds? Uh... So there are, um, the way that the count works is there are people that will report what they see at their feeders, and they can contribute that way. But there's also, you know, anywhere from 40, 50, 60 people that will spread out within the count circle. Uh, in the Burlington count, you've got the waterfront, so you've got a whole host of waterfowl. Sure. Yep. Um, you've got a lot of fields, and so all those people, the, the circle gets broken down into individual yep. units and groups are focused on that. So that's where the social aspect to the Christmas bird count Plus, comes in. It sounds in. like you're covering a lot of ground. You're yes. not just at feeders, but you're no. also not just in, uh, you know, the middle of nowhere. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, I've done the Burlington count before. Sometimes you're picking up things like pine gross beaks in uh, industrial parks. They're feeding on the crab apples. Other times, you know, Dr. Al Strong at UVM, who's been on the show before, has trucked out all the way out to Delta Park to find winter wrens out there. So. Uh, a lot of people do the, the, the count by car, but a lot of people do it by foot as well. Do the counters come across uh, what I consider the, the night birds, the, the owls in particular? Yeah, some counters will actually start at night and they'll try to get those night birds as part of the count. But this year, um, great horned owls came in uh, as a high count for the count. So folks had, let's see, 10 great horned owls and the other one, um, barred owls. So here's the great horned owls, has that tough, there's our barred owls. They also came in at, you know, there were 13 of them seen. So that's some dedicated counters because generally these are not birds that we're gonna see during the day. That's true, but I was driving back from Middlebury yesterday yesterday and had one fly above me yeah. off of a telephone pole. So they can be around during the day and people yeah. can pick them up at feeders too. And that's quite a treat when that happens yes, out it of is. the blue. Yes, it is. Uh, waterfowl. So a high count for common loon this year. That's um, a good sign. Yeah, so common loons, uh, this is their winter plumage, so it doesn't look like their black and white traditional summer plumage. Uh, but they had 19 common loons. Um, you know, part of this count is along the Shelburne shorefront, Burlington waterfront, Front Colchester, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of water to see. And then, as with any Christmas bird count, there's always the oddity that probably shouldn't be around. And this year was a gray catbird. Now, gray catbirds, um, you know, I when I did work in Belize, I came across gray catbirds in Belize. So this is a species that usually migrates. This bird stuck around. Uh, it's a fruit eater. So maybe taking advantage of uh, fruit supplies, but that's a good bird for um, 
the Christmas bird count. That's a great way to end things, and we're going to remind our viewers if they have a bird-related question, you can certainly pass it along to Mark. We put his address on the screen at Audubon, Vermont in Huntington, and the zip is 05462. Uh, also, every month we provide Mark's email address, mlabar at audubon.org. You can send along uh, your notes and your pictures, and Mark will find an answer for you, we hope, on an upcoming edition of Bird Notes. Sounds good. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome. That is our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence.